Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We have a lot to cover today, from SpaceX bringing what remains of Booster 11 back to Starbase, all while contending with both the launch of Crew-9 to the International Space Station and the grounding of Falcon 9 again following an off-nominal deorbit burn of that same flight, and also launching another Starlink mission. Over in Asia, both Japan and China launched payloads to space, with Japan launching the IGS Radar 8 satellite and China launching over 10 different payloads across three launches of three different rockets. All of this and so much more, so sit back and enjoy. To begin with Starship updates, last week I covered the raising of the aft portion of Booster 11 from the Gulf of Mexico by the vessel HOS Ridgewind. Later on in the week, the ship arrived at port. Massive thanks to Jack Beyer from NASA Spaceflight for these incredible shots of the moment. Later on, as nightfall rolled in, we saw the wreckage of the booster offloaded, and then later transported back to Starbase's Massey's test site for post-flight and post-four months underwater analysis. The salvage operation hasn't ended yet though. Tracking information shows that the Ridgewind is heading back out to the Booster 11 splashdown point, presumably to dredge up more pieces of the rocket. I wonder if we'll get more pieces of the engine section, or maybe even the recovery of the grid fins. Let me know your bets in the comments below. Over at Launchpad B, work continues, and last week saw excavation work begin on the flame trench. Yep, Pad B isn't going to be a copy of Pad A's table. Pad B is looking like a much more traditional launch pad with a flame trench, as first properly confirmed in the construction plans for the site. After recently completing a six-engine static fire test at Massey's, the Flight 6 Starship, Ship 31, was returned to the high bay, and then the scaffolding started going back up around it, presumably to allow workers to finish the installation of its upgraded heat shield. As you can see, the scaffolding is a pretty extensive structure, extending basically all the way to the top of the vehicle. As for Flight 5's Starship, that remains fully stacked atop Booster 12, having completed propellant load tests last Monday. It looks like a D-stack could be coming very soon though, as a few hours ago, earlier today, the ship quick disconnect arm separated from the vehicle. We'll have to wait and see if this is of any significance. At least one more D-stack will be required before launch so that the flight termination system can be installed on the ship, but there is a very real possibility now that Booster 12 won't be leaving the launch pad until the launch itself, as last week the orbital launch mount alignment pins were removed, something usually only done prior to a launch attempt. I'm very curious to see how this situation continues to develop. The biggest spaceflight launch of the week had to be the launch of NASA's SpaceX Crew-9 mission, which launched with just two crew members on board, NASA astronaut Nick Haig and Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov, as opposed to the usual number of four crew members in view of the fact that it'll need to return Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams from the station, after NASA deemed the Boeing Starliner capsule that brought them there too dangerous to bring them back. This was a big first though. This was the first human spaceflight launch from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral, following the recent completion of SpaceX's Crew Access Tower at the site. Here's the X logo in the Crew Access section getting its first ever signatures. The mission was a success, but not completely without fault. Unfortunately, after a successful launch of Dragon, Falcon 9's second stage was disposed in the ocean as planned, but it experienced an off-nominal deorbit burn, which resulted in the second stage landing in the ocean safely as planned, but outside of the targeted area, which has resulted in Falcon 9 being grounded until the root cause of this issue is properly understood. Normally, SpaceX Falcon 9 crew missions see the first stage land on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, but this time it landed back at the Space Coast, at Landing Zone 1, giving us an always great to see third person view of the stage touching down. Yesterday, the Dragon capsule completed its approach to the International Space Station and successfully docked, beginning the crew's stay in space, with mission end expected in March 2025 with splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. This is also the first crewed spaceflight with brain rot. The Falcon 9 and uh, along the way was a sweet ride. I'm pretty sure my youngest son had say it was Sigma. 
<laughs> Crew-9 wasn't SpaceX's only orbital launch of the week, though. Last Wednesday saw another Starlink mission. The Falcon 9 took off from Vandenberg, carrying 20 Starlink satellites to Shell-9, and after successful stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage made a successful landing on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship in the Pacific Ocean, and this particular booster has now hit double figures, with this mission being its 10th overall launch and landing. Last week also saw some launch activity from both Japan and China. To start with China, they launched three rockets, two on Tuesday and one on Friday. Tuesday's launch activity kicked off with a solid propellant Smart Dragon 3 rocket, which launched from an ocean platform in the South China Sea, carrying eight payloads to low Earth orbit. These were all for a range of different Chinese customers, three of which were Earth observation satellites on behalf of Ada Space, a Chinese company aiming to create global Earth image data networks with 192 satellites, as well as five other satellites whose purpose is yet to be confirmed, from customers who are also yet to be identified, though we know Wuhan University operates at least one of the satellites. Tuesday's other launch was a four-stage solid propellant Kinetica 1 rocket. This lifted off from the Jiquan launch site, carrying four satellites to low Earth orbit. Two of these were the first two communication satellites for the AirSat constellation, an Earth observation satellite on behalf of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and a meteorological research satellite for the Changcheng Institute of Optics, Fine Mechanics and Physics. The remaining Chinese launch was, as previously mentioned, on Friday, and was a Long March 2D, carrying just the one payload to low Earth orbit, the Shijian-19 payload for the China Academy of Space Technology. This payload is interesting. It's a test platform for reusable technology and returnable microgravity experiments, described by official sources as the first reusable and returnable test satellite. I wonder if we'll get any footage of the capsule's return. My mind says probably not, but my heart hopes that we will. Especially considering the amazing footage provided by Deep Blue's latest test of its Nebula 1 test vehicle, which is obviously another Chinese rocket. So there is hope. You know, speaking of China, they're ramping up the stakes with the race back to the moon with the US, with the unveiling of the spacesuits that they'll use to let their Taikonauts traverse the lunar surface by 2030 if the program proceeds undelayed. A lot of people have criticised these suits as looking very similar to the Apollo spacesuits, but, I mean, there really are only so many ways a spacesuit is gonna look, right? It's just a big insulated bodysuit and a helmet with a life support backpack. As mentioned earlier, Japan conducted an orbital launch last week as well, with their H-2A rocket, which carried the IGS Radar 8 satellite to low Earth orbit. The IGS Radar 8 is operated by the Japanese Cabinet Intelligence and Research Office, and as that institute's name might suggest, it's a reconnaissance satellite, and as such, little has been disclosed about it, but according to Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, who build the H-2A rockets, the satellite was successfully deployed into its planned orbit. Due to delays with the Dream Chaser, ULA's Vulcan rocket will be carrying nothing to orbit on its next launch, which is currently scheduled to happen later this week, no earlier than the 4th of October. Well, it's technically not launching completely empty, instead it'll carry a mass simulator payload to heliocentric orbit, along with some experiments and demonstrations of future Centaur 5 technologies. It was rolled out for the world to see earlier today, so hopefully we shouldn't see any significant delay with this launch. But I won't be able to cover it next Monday, and that's because, I'm now going somewhat meta, I'm taking a moment to quickly announce that there won't be a space this week next Monday as I'll be in Germany attending Space Cray Today 2024, so if you're going there, then we'll get to meet. Unfortunately, my cat and my house sitter can't edit videos, so there's no real way I'll be able to create a news video for Monday, but Kerbal Space Program content should hopefully be unaffected, thanks to the power of crunch and you know, pre-making videos. This Saturday's video will be a showcase of the KNES mod, looking at a variety of European space shuttles, and if you're a member of my channel on YouTube or a Patreon supporter, then you will already have early access to this video, so click the links below if you want to sign up and reap your rewards. Otherwise, last week's KSP video is available for everyone to see. I decided to launch a satellite payload to space using only air-breathing jet engines, launching both a miniature space station from the Kerbal Space Center and a top-secret spy satellite from the desert during a thunderstorm. If that sounds like a good time, then check it out via that card on screen. And of course, big thank you to all the names on the right there who support the channel and make all of this content possible. I hope you all enjoyed the Space Shuttle video. But that is the end of today's episode of Space This Week, so I hope you enjoyed the ride, and I'll catch you in the next one. Or in Germany. It's very soon, so... Um, this is the end of the video, yep. <laughs>